From deep in the heart of Central Texas, it's the Best of the Outdoors podcast. Brought to you by Texas Fish and Game Magazine, the voice of the Texas outdoor nation. I'm your humble host, Dustin Vaughn Warnke, the hostess with the mostest, back with another podcast. So excited that you guys have taken the time to download this show, stream it online, or however you were listening. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you also for telling a friend. Thank you also for giving us a five-star review if you like what you hear on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. And uh, feel free to reach out to me, man. You can find me at Texas Fish and Games website, which is fishgame.com. I'm the associate publisher here and also your podcast host for this show. Really, really excited about being back with you guys. Every two weeks we do these shows and uh, just have a great opportunity to share with you my message of hope and inspiration in the outdoor lifestyle and all that encompasses uh, hunting and fishing and camping and hiking and all the great outdoor things that we do. I really, really am excited about this show. I've wanted to do a show like this for quite a while uh, around eating the stuff that we catch and kill out there, eating the things that we harvest in the outdoors. And uh, one of the reasons why I am a hunter and a fisherman is simply so I I can eat wild, organic, non-GMO, non-hormone um, food and, uh, and, and protein. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like I'll say later in the show, as weird as it sounds, I kind of have some of the same, uh, viewpoints about slaughterhouses and, you know, the way that animals are kept in cages and, and, uh, you know, small areas before they're harvested in, in, a, in a slaughterhouse. Uh, for me, you know, as vegetarians do, I don't really like that environment for my meat. I don't really like, you know, my animals being stressed out and stuff before they're killed and that kind of stuff. So, a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, I um, I agree with the reasons why a lot of people don't eat meat um, for the same reasons why I eat organic and wild meat as much as I can. Now, we still eat chicken in my house, but um, can't really hunt those for sport, but... <laughs> Um, you know, for the most part, most of our red meat, aside from a New York strip that my wife will buy for the, um, for, uh, the, the, the value of cow that we have in our house every once in a while, we usually buy prime New York strip and that kind of stuff, um, you know, higher end stuff. But, you know, we, we eat deer, we eat hog, uh, wild hogs, we eat, um, fish, uh, red fish on a half shell, we eat fried fish, uh, we, we eat baked fish, tilapia. Um, all those kind of things that I can go out there and bow fish for or bow hunt for or gun hunt for uh, or catch on rod and reel. And that's just kind of part of the outdoor lifestyle. So I've wanted to, and this kind of just popped in my head this last week uh, after I released our last show that was a fishing show. I kind of said, why don't we do a hunting show but base it around, you know, uh, like they have on YouTube, the catch, clean, and cook. You know, the whole idea of, of catching and cleaning and cooking your your wild game and uh, doing that kind of thing. And so really it it just kind of all dawned on me that it would be a smart thing to bring up a few cookbooks and stuff that I read to bring a guest on that that talks a lot on his podcast about uh, hunting and fishing and and cooking and cleaning the the and, and preparing meals out of the fish and, and game that he catches and that's Jeremy Beeston from the Cast Blast Grill Chill podcast and um, you know Jeremy and I go way back we've met each other in person before uh, a couple of times now. And uh, he's really involved with back backcountry uh, hunters and anglers, and uh, really, really great guy about conservation, um, about supporting um, you know the future of this sport, and really somebody that I I kind of look up to in a lot of ways as a colleague in this business of media and stuff that we create. Um, just that he's got the heart of a. Um, a right, you know, the, the, the right heart of an outdoorsman is what I'm trying to say. And he listens to our podcast just about every episode. And I really thank him for that. And it's great to have him on. So Jeremy, if you're listening, I know you listen to all these shows. So, uh, thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for being on today. So, uh, I'll do that real quick. I've got a couple of things to knock out, some housekeeping in order to take care of. If you're not done so already, please subscribe to the podcast. It does not cost you anything. It is free. You get a new show every two weeks. That's twice a month. We have a new show last month. I did three shows because we had a lot of sponsors to get through but uh this month i'm just rocking it and um we don't have a ton of podcast sponsors and i'm just kind of back to two but uh i wanted to bring up a couple of events and a couple of collaboration things that are going on first of all if you want to meet jeremy um at these backcountry hunters and anglers events uh there's two of them that are i don't know if he's going to be at either one of them but i'm pretty sure he's going to be at one of them um 
the one that he has, uh, the, the backcountry hunters and anglers are having uh, May 25th, and then they're having another one June 22nd. And the one on June 22nd is in Houston. The one on May 25th is in San Antonio. And also June 22nd is the Texas Air Gun Show. I have all the information for all the stuff in the show notes or the post or wherever you're hearing this, uh, the description uh, on YouTube and Facebook, the post on fishgame.com or the uh, podcast show notes if you're listening on your mobile device or a podcast player. All that stuff is on there. The links to everything's on there. And uh, Texas Air Gun Show, the 22nd and 23rd. Uh, and then uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers uh, with a full draw film tour event that they are doing. Um, really cool stuff that they're up to with uh, with some of the stuff that they're doing. So check those things out. Also, you can check out Jeremy at uh, on Facebook. I've got the links for him and Cast Blast Grill Chills podcast and Facebook group. And also, uh, lest we forget some cookbooks that we're talking about, those will be in the show notes as well. You can check those out. Um, but we're doing a collaboration, and this is just getting off the ground, so be patient with it. I've got the link in the show notes with Frio Coolers, all right? And Frio is uh, one of my favorite companies for ice chests and drinkware. I've got a Frio cup right here on my desk that I'm uh, rattling my ice in uh, the microphone. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's got a leather wrap from Double J Saddlery of a redfish tail. Uh, badge, if you want to call it, um, and it's got like this alligator wrap on. It's really cool. But they make these tumblers called the twenty four sevens. They make hard side, soft side coolers. They make um, vintage coolers. They make uh, a wide variety of stuff. My whole garage is full of Frio stuff, so I love their love their stuff. But they're doing a collaboration with us here at Texas Fishing Game, and you can check out the link in the show notes. It's a little bit long. I'm going to try to get us a shorter domain that'll be a little bit easier for you to remember. Uh, and go to but uh, right now the link for that is in the show notes you can check that out um, uh, through Frio Ice Chest and really some cool products I'm checking this out right now Um, I'll pull it up here Uh, there's all kinds of different things that you can uh, you can buy you've got shirts you've got um, uh, stainless steel mugs you've got the stainless steel Frio 24-7 cups the stainless steel tumblers with the wraps Uh, you've got the cups that uh, the, the tumblers with the powder coat and then you've got uh, the large cups, 24-7. Uh, it's a smaller cup, uh, 24 ounces, and then a 30-ounce uh, cup with the Texas Fishing Game theme and logo. You've got the vintage coolers with the logo, soft side coolers with the logo, hard side coolers with the logo, and special artwork uh, with the Texas flag. Really cool stuff. So kind of a selection of their products available for sale uh, through our website that we have, especially through them, and that's texas-fish-game.freoeyeschest.com. Don't worry about remembering all that. It's in the show notes. You can check it out. But we just launched this. This is one of the first forays in launching this I'm doing on this podcast. I'll probably mention it just about every show. Go get you some Texas Fishing Game Frio stuff, man. Awesome collaboration. I've wanted to do something like this for a while with these guys, and it's finally getting off the ground. And I'm really, really excited about having our own branded Frio stuff from them. And certainly there are other cooler companies, certainly there are other Tumblr companies and stuff like that. That's just a collaboration we're doing with our brand on their products. And it's just kind of something we're doing to help you know, spread the outdoor nation word out there about Texas Fish and Game and what we're all about. And uh, I think that'll be really cool. So anyway, I've been talking a lot. Um, lots of fun on this podcast, guys. Uh, we're just looking to basically get things to you that are accessible. And that's what the show's always been about. This is a show will always be about. It's not about catching the biggest fish. It's not about shooting the biggest buck or the biggest elk or the biggest whatever. It's about the outdoor lifestyle. It's about the whole part that encompasses everything that we do, the spiritual journey that we are on as outdoorsmen, uh, that communion with God, that communion with nature, that communion with the with the spiritual aspect of our lives. So important to get recharged and reinvigorated, if that's a good word, um, in the outdoors. And that's something I'm really, really passionate about if you guys listen to the show at any time. And like I say, if you haven't done so, tell a friend and uh, subscribe to our show. Give us a five-star rating on YouTube or um, Facebook or uh, um, you know any place like that that you like listening to the podcast. That really means a lot to me. I love connecting with every single one of you guys. Uh, just like the Texas Air Gun Show, I'm going to probably plan to be on that. I don't know how I'm going to do that in the backcountry, hunter, hunters and anglers, but I'll probably be at the Texas Air Gun Show um, in June, and I'd love to meet you if you just come up and see me. I'll probably be broadcasting some stuff from the from that show. I hope to be, uh, since I didn't do NRA this year, and we'll see about that. It's up in uh, uh, Weatherford area, up in the uh, Arlington Sportsman's Club, which is going to be a really cool show. So, Anyway, enough about all that. Let's get into our podcast. Here is my interview with Jeremy Beeston, awesome guy. Here we go. 
Join me on the phone, Mr. Jeremy Beeston from the Cast Blast Grill Chill Podcast and so many other things you do in the outdoors. How you doing today, Jeremy? I'm doing spectacular today. It's a beautiful sunny afternoon and uh, the weather has been, aside from all the rain, been relatively nice for a mid-May kind of time frame. It's uh, typically already a million degrees out and I don't think we've broken 90 but a couple of times and both times I did that I was out on a river fishing and swimming with my kids so I'll take I'll take that kind of kind of weather on those kind of days it's been weird this time of year I mean it's been raining a lot more than it should be and it's 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 colder and then it's hotter and then it's hotter and then it's colder it's 59 when you wake up and it's like you know 89 when you go to sleep I mean it's crazy <laughs> yeah definitely but that's Texas spring that's for Texas you you know for just you. You know, stick around if you don't like the weather for about 15, 20 minutes. Just wait. It's change. <laughs> That's what they always say about Texas weather. And the people that listen to this show that are way outside of Texas that are in other countries and stuff don't really understand how volatile it can be or, or just, you know, changeable it can be from day to day, hour to hour. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. But there's been flooding. There's been all kinds of stuff. And I'm recording this show around lunchtime, and we're talking about food. So I just thought that would be... <laughs> I ate a little something before I got on this podcast, but I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, yeah, that's probably going to be uh, probably by the end of this, I'm going to have to either reach into my bag of jerky over here or actually stop and get something to eat. I've been trying to do intermittent fasting it's, right. for uh, for a guy who's uh, a, a a little round. It's uh, not always easy to do. I understand. I'm a little round with you, so. <laughs> Um, but that's cool. Um, so I was thinking one of the things, you know, you and, um, and Trevor are in duck hunting. And one of the things I need to cover more on this show is duck hunting for the people that are really hardcore and passionate about that. But the thing with all that is that what do you do with the duck, you know, and is duck meat good? And some people like it and some people don't. And I mean, do you bacon wrap it? And I'm looking at an article on Texas Fish and Game from Texas Tasted, which is at the back of our magazine, for teal tenderloin wraps. <laughs> and yeah. I, I'm just I like, mean, oh my gosh, this looks so good. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's kind of the thing about, you know, wild game in general here in Texas is, you know, there's pretty much two ways everybody cooks everything. Either they... They, they pound it out and they chicken fry it or they bacon wrap it. Right. There's so many more ways and so many better ways, you know, to cook it. I mean, I'm not knocking, you know, chicken fried backstrap and, and cream gravy because it's absolutely delicious. But you can't have chicken fried deer and, you know, bacon jalapeno wrapped everything, you know, with cream cheese for, for every single meal. You know, there's right. a, you know, there's a whole slew of cookbooks that are dedicated, you know, to, uh, you know, just cooking wild game. Uh, Hank Shaw's duck, duck, uh, goose for anybody who's into waterfowl and, you know, has even the slightest, you know, touch of ability to cook is, you know, that's a go to for me anytime I'm, you know, want to do something a little bit different. I have my probably 10 or 15 duck recipes that I go to and, you know, teal season, I'll definitely make, you know, bacon wrapped jalapeno you know, teal poppers and they're delicious. And I'll take, uh, you know, a whole teal breast and do a bacon weave on it. And, you know, it's, it's delicious. Uh, the biggest thing I will say about wild game cooking with the exception of pork and mountain lion and any other critter where trichinosis is an issue. Yes. Medium rare at the most. Absolutely. Or else, or else you're going to get that nasty liver, like bad liver taste yeah. or you're going to get uh, that shoe leather kind of what people call that gamey flavor. Right. And, and shoe leather where it just chews and chews and chews. If you cook it to medium, you know, medium rare, you know, to, to, to rare. I like most of mine actually a little closer to rare than medium rare right. on my wild game. But I mean, if you shoot a, a mallard or a gadwall or even a spoonie, you know, people, you know, always dogging on old Spoonie and say, you know, oh, he's a trash duck. He's no good to eat. And if you take that breast out fresh, skin off, and take it, put it in some ice water for just long enough. We're not talking overnight. We're talking, you know, an hour, just enough to let some of that blood out. Sure. And then pull it out, salt, pepper it on a screaming hot grill, 
about depending on the size of your breast, anywhere from, you know, two to five minutes a side. Yeah. You know, and, you know, right before you put them on, brush them with a little olive oil or even vegetable oil, season them up with your favorite steak seasoning. And like I said, two to five minutes a side. And it eats like a steak. I've had people that like swear they hate duck. They're like, duck's awful. Tastes like bad liver. And I'm like, <laughs> no, you just never had it cooked right. They're like, right. no, nah, all, all ducks taste like trash. I'm like, no, they don't. Trust me. Just try this. And they're amazed. And, um, you know, another thing people typically do, and, it, and this has been something that I've known a couple of guys that are, you know, way, that shoot way more ducks than me, you know, me out there, uh, beating the bushes on public land and only getting to hunt weekends. I, you know, over the course of a season, I may harvest anywhere between, you know, a few dozen to maybe on a good year, a couple hundred ducks, right. you know, well, not a couple hundred, maybe a hundred, 110. You know, if I hunt a lot and hunt in good spots where I can shoot a bunch of limits, you know, over the course of the season and, you know, hunt all my vacation, I think my best season ever was 108 ducks. Wow. That's so, a lot of birds. Wow. But, you know, when you start getting that many ducks and is what you can actually do, and I know uh, Belleville Meat Market will do this, you can actually save your breasts from for the entire season, take them, put them in freezer bags, and then take you up, you know, 10 pounds of duck meat and actually have sausage made out of them. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, or you can do like I do and actually, uh, you know, make your own sausage. It's, it's surprisingly affordable to make your own sausage and jerky. I make uh, a good amount of of duck jerky mm-hmm. uh trevor this year he actually took a uh hooded meganser and made jerky out of it he was like it's good <laughs> i'll never forget the time i tried uh uh sheep jerky uh what do you call it texas doll jerky and i still can't get that taste out of my mouth but you know db wall game processing and taxidermy the my friends that own that i rolled through there the other day and they had a rambolet ram that they made jerky and it tastes surprisingly good it tasted like beef jerky or it tasted like turkey jerky or something like that um but it did not have that awful mutton taste i don't know what they i think it's the seasoning they use and they clean the meat real good and everything like that i did not i was not so careful with mine they cut it into little strips and you know you can make jerky out of just about everything as my point i guess to your point yeah exactly and i mean and even to do it at home you know the biggest thing with jerky is making sure you clean all the fat and all the silver skin off right and then you know you know get your get your jerky mix and your cure and just you know read the instructions follow your instructions on it and then you can go to uh my dehydrator actually came from big lots for twenty dollars and it's a genuine Yep, it's wow. a genuine, it's a genuine Ronco romp appeal, you know, dehydrator. <laughs> Love that guy. Set it and forget it. <laughs> exactly, and I mean, it's got either six or eight trays with it, and uh, you know, whenever I'm doing a large batch of jerky, um, I can do about oh, about four pounds of meat with the trays because I actually bought some extra trays. And you just kind of stack them up and then you take like the bottom two or three trays, move them to the top every about four hours. And then you kind of go to bed, you wake up in the morning and you've got to, you'll smell it when you come into your kitchen. It smells kind of like, uh, like sausage cooking. And you go in there and you've got a whole tray full of jerky and, you know, you may have to take your top couple trays and move them down to the bottom again for another couple hours to finish, you know, getting them the way that you like them. And maybe the stuff on the bottom will be like that, you know, kind of crispy, hard jerky, but right. You know, once you figure out your time frame on that and how you slice it. But the trick I've kind of learned is I actually I went to Harbor Freight and bought one of those fifty, sixty dollar cheap meat grinders. Yeah, sure. And I and I'll freeze my meat and I'll take that cheap that cheap meat grinder and that way you get a consistent slice so all your meat's the same thickness. Sure, sure. And it makes your finished product a lot more uniform. So you're like um, using a jerky shooter in that case when you're grinding it up, correct? Yeah, um, okay. I have a jerky gun too. And jerky that's gun. That's, an- to say, that, yeah. that's another good way to to do it is to take it and you know run it through a meat grinder once, twice, you know three times. So like you want it fine for that jerky gun, and then you can just you know make you like the the Jack Link stick style yeah. jerky with that, and it's extremely good. I've done it with beef. I've done it with deer. I've done it with um, with ducks. And it all turns out good. It's just a matter about finding the the brand of cure and spice you like and then just kind of sticking with that. And then you can always tweak 
you know, the base recipe by adding like red pepper flakes or cayenne or teriyaki or any other flavor you want to just change the flavor profile of that one particular mix. Cause the one thing I found is a lot of the different jerky cures, you know, even though it both, they both say mesquite, they'll be totally different flavors right. when they're done. Yeah. Even though but the luckily, spice smells something like, you know, whatever it is, it's going to taste a little bit different sometimes. Right. Yeah, exactly. It is just a different amount of, of the white pepper, black pepper, sure. garlic, onion, and how much liquid smoke they use, what kind of liquid smoke sure. they're using in that, you know, in that, in that mix. And, but that's a kind of a go-to for me is making jerky whenever I have a excess of wild game and I don't know what to do, don't know what to do with it. And everybody loves it. It's always a huge hit. I have people that, that refuse to eat anything that, that was walking around, even though they'll, uh, they'll eat beef and chicken and stuff, but right. that comes from a, a cellophane package in the store. They don't correlate that with a living critter, Yeah, but uh, but it was alive just like everything else. And at the end of the day, you know, I can take that, that deer jerky or that duck jerky or that goose jerky and put it out in front of them and they will tear down on it. And they know what it is, but they don't care. They're like, it's jerky. It's good. Give me some more. How did your uh, Sandhill crane trip, are you the one that took that or was Trevor the one that took that? Uh, yes. Uh, me and five guys went up to Lubbock, Texas, and we went and we had a absolute ball shooting a five-man limit of sandhill cranes up there in lubbock with the guys from red eye outfitters it was a it was a trip to remember and a trip we will be doing again this year cool that's good well i just asked that because you know they call sandhill crane ribeye in the sky and you've mentioned that before on your podcast you know on um on your uh in your social media post um what did you do with that did you did you cut that up in steaks or how, how would you do that uh, okay so is what i did there's a there's a whole variety of ways that, that, that we did the sand hills. Um, uh, we breasted them out. We took the, the legs and thighs and did them like that. Uh, one of the guys took a whole bird and uh, skinned it out like a, like a, like a kind of like a rotisserie chicken. Sure. And he did it. He did it that way baked in the oven. Um, the thing with sandhill crane is it's a bird that eats like a beef. Um, you take the, my go-to way to eat sandhill crane is to take a whole breast, trim the silver skim. Uh, I like to trim it when it's slightly thawed. Mm -hmm. That way you don't waste any of the meat. Uh, you can get that silver skin. You can kind of fillet it like a fish and not just take the silver skin and take just like the thinnest layer of sure. meat off with it. Yeah, I've done that. And, yeah. and then is what I'll do is I'll take a, a Ziploc bag. I'll pour a little bit of olive oil in it and then i'll shake some some steak seasoning in it and take it and let it kind of marinate in that for oh 30 minutes or so pull it out throw it on the grill uh with just uh just steak seasoning on it and that's the go-to way to do it um and then my legs and thighs i made uh kind of like pulled cranking tacos in the crock pot because uh, of all great. the connective tissue in there, I yeah. just took bones and all and threw them in the crock pot with a uh, with a beef fajita seasoning. Yeah, and threw it in there with a little bit of beef stock and let them cook all day, and then pulled the bones, picked them, kind of picked out all the all the tendons and stuff that were left, and that was a huge hit. Wow, that's incredible! What a what a great idea. I mean, as far as the different ways to make a a, a bird, if you will, you know, a crane, um, they've got a lot more meat than your average bird, correct? Oh yeah, um, I'd probably say the average crane breast is probably anywhere from for a lesser is probably a pound and a half to some of the graders that we killed wow. down in uh, South Texas mm -hmm. on my uh, on my buddy's place down there. Those might have been up to like two, two and a half pounds. I mean, they were. <laughs> That's great. Wow. Um, and then I still have a couple. I've kind of hoarded my, my crane. I still have a couple breasts left. And something I'm planning on doing here um, when I have some guests over, it's kind of I break it out on special occasions. And I'm planning on taking it and, and doing like uh, steak fingers with it. I want to take it 
uh, do like steak fingers, uh, yeah. tenderize them, and then uh, do them, uh, try chicken frying them. Yeah, sure. I, ha- I, ha- I haven't done that yet, but, you know, chicken frying everything is kind of the go-to here in Texas, so I'm going to try some chicken fried crane. Is that meat more like uh, red or white or anything? It is red. red. It is okay. deep, deep, deep red. red. It is, like, like I said, it's a bird be. that eats like a beef. If I yeah. was to hand you a piece of it, uh, think it was cooked, beef. Not, yeah. not tell you what it was, you would look at it, you'd say, oh, this is beef. You would taste it, you'd be cool. like, oh, this is prime rib. It's really that good. Wow. That's it great. is. It is. Out of everything I've ever eaten, beef, pork, wild, it's probably probably number one. I like Sandhill Crane better than I like Neil Guy, better than I like Axis Deer. It is it's next level good. And like I said, it, it I think one of the reasons I really like it is just the sheer novelty of it is it's a bird that eats like a beef. It's <laughs> You would just never in a thousand million years think that that came from a bird. But if you stop and think about what the Sandhill Crane is, is it's kind of sort of like a flying cow. It yeah. doesn't it, it, it doesn't eat aquatic vegetation as far as I know. It only eats grains and seeds and grass and things of that nature out in fields. It roosts in water, but its right. feet are not webbed. Right, right, right. So it'll go roost in, in shallow, shallow water at night. But during the day, it feeds in the fields. You know, here by my house in uh, Navasota for, I don't know, four months this winter, we probably had four to 500 cranes out in a cattle pasture every day. I'd wow. watch them fly in there and then fly out in the evenings. And what's really bad is this is an area of Texas that has no sandhill crane season, so... They were uh, they were safe. They were very safe. But I was just like, if you guys would just just quit tormenting me and flying over my house every day, I would greatly <laughs> appreciate it. I actually had a dream the other night that I was at somebody's somebody's house, you know, just some friends, some acquaintances and stuff. And there were so many birds flying over. It was like it was like what they have in. Um, in uh argentina you know it was just like and there were all kinds of different species of birds flying over so you had your choice of duck or dove or whatever and i was like that's like a sportsman's paradise right there to have all those different you know i don't know i just thought that was funny oh um, yeah just, just well, you, yeah go ahead i'm sorry you just you just brought up another bird uh doves you know everybody i know in texas you know they make jalapeno poppers and i'll make right. jalapeno poppers after opening weekend every time but if if, if you go to one of those you know, really good dove shoots to where, you know, you shoot three limits. That's 15 birds a day. That's 45 birds. You know, you get two poppers out of a bird. That's a whole lot of poppers. Yeah. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can cook dove that are surprisingly delicious. Um, and I can't remember what cookbook it is. I want to say it's Hank Shaw's. Um, he'll actually whole pluck doves, roll them in cornmeal and whole fry them. Oh wow! Uh, with with the skin on, and that is an extremely good way to to eat a dove. Another good way to do them is a way that uh, Trevor actually taught me, and he um, he'll take those craft cubes of mm-hmm. cheese, mm-hmm. and he'll take that dove and he'll put that that uh, that that cube of cheese on that dove, and then he'll take it and bacon wrap that and skewer the the bacon around it with a toothpick and then rather than um grill it he'll actually deep fry it oh there's an idea and it is those are really really good um texas parks and wildlife um their tv show a few years back did a a thing on public land dove hunting and they had a, a chef on down there and he did a uh traditional uh, kind of like chili mole dove yeah, right. recipe uh-huh. with Coke in it that he cooked there at the camp. And I've made that a couple of times for tacos, and it's spectacular. <laughs> I bet that's good with the Coca-Cola in there and everything. Yeah, wow. I'll have to get that recipe. That's really good. That sounds really good. Hey, I've never tried a mole yeah, sauce in my life, so that would be really cool. Yeah, and then... um and then another thing that people don't think to do is kebabs. I've yeah. done kebabs a whole bunch of times with Dove. 
because the vegetables will actually shield your dove from overcooking. Right. I didn't even think about that. Like your red peppers or your onions or whatever will shield the bird, you know, the bird mm-hmm. breast or whatever. Right. Okay. Yep. And then you can just take it in whatever your favorite, you know, marinade is. Just throw them in there 30 minutes before you're ready to start cooking and toss you a little bit of marinade on there or just salt and pepper. I mean, most of your birds eat really good if you just handle them like a rare piece of beef. Um, right. It, it's kind of surprising, like, because I always thought dove were livery whenever I was growing up and people would always have me over for dove. And it was always like, I, I get why these are good because, like, every fifth one I have is delicious. But some of these, it's just, it tastes like bad liver. And then that's another thing a lot of guys uh, don't do. Uh, um, this past season, uh, we started hunting a lot with a, a buddy of ours that went up with us there on that Sandhill Crane hunt. And... Evan, he took all the hearts, all the livers, the gizzards, and everything, and and you know, you can do that on all your ducks, all your geese, cranes, and you know your deer. Take your take your heart, your liver. It's kind of not done a lot here in Texas, from what I've seen over the years. But you know, deer liver and onions is spectacular. Okay, I'm I'm not a big fan of uh, beef liver, but right. venison liver it is very good. That's cool. Uh, it's just one of those things where I think that it's um, that you know it's 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 like the Native Americans and other indigenous people before modern civilization. They'd use everything but the squeal. You know, I mean, if you're talking about a hog or everything but the bleed, if it was the deer, and it's yep. being resourceful with that animal and making you know making good use of of all the different parts. You know, one of the things that I was reading the other day in uh, Brian Slavin, he's our Texas test, he's Texas gourmet editor. Um, and, uh, he has mesquite grilled dove wraps and he was talking about how a lot of us, and I've been guilty of this. I don't know about you. We'll take our birds and just throw them in the back of our vest. And then, you know, four hours later, we'll throw them in the, you know, we'll pluck them and throw them in the cooler. And by then you wonder why your meat tastes all gamey and nasty, you know? Uh, but his whole thing is like you were saying, treat your meat like a, or treat your birds like a rare piece of beef or treat your, your game, you know, accordingly to put them in a Ziploc bag and cool them off and throw them in the ice chest or whatever right away. So you have, you know, them when you're ready to clean them, you know, it's just another good idea. Yeah. That's, uh, that's something I've taken to doing in the past couple of years, um, is I carry a little six pack cooler with me now whenever mm-hmm. I go dove hunting. Right. Uh, with duck hunting, it's typically not that big of a deal because it's usually very cold. Cold, right? Cold. Uh, and wet, yeah. But but you know that first weekend of September, it's usually still scorching hot, and you know most people here in Texas, you know they'll they'll dove hunt the first weekend and the second weekend, and then it kind of falls off after that. Right. So take your little six pack cooler, get you a couple water bottles, freeze them solid, throw them down in the bottom of that little six pack cooler, and it'll. You know, you throw your bottles of water in there to keep them cool. Sure. And then as you're out there drinking your bottled water and then rather than, you know, throwing your birds in your vest or, you know, if you're not sitting right there by your cooler, if you moved over to a different shade tree to go. But every time you get three or four birds, go walk over there and go throw your birds, you know, in that cooler. Yeah. yeah and then when you get the back, back to the, the truck, tailgate. transfer them, you know, to uh, I'll plug one of your sponsors here, you know, go throw it in your Frio ice chest. There you go. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, and then another thing is, is, you know, to, to talk about another one of your sponsors is, you know, you, you always recommending those, those ice packs, um, Artigice. You, yeah, Artigice, Artigice, yeah. yeah. Um, rather than any of your game, be it ducks, deer, whatever, rather than keeping it in that watery slushy, either get you a product like Artigice or, you know, freeze you, um, you know, one gallon water jugs yep. and put it in your cooler and, you know, use that to keep your meat cool rather than leaving your meat in a in a slushy, nasty, bloody thing. And on top of that, it'll keep your cooler from smelling like death if you forget to wash it out. Well, and bacteria and that kind of stuff as well. And one of the products I picked up, I don't know if you saw it at the Houston Fishing Show. This. Did you go to the Houston Fishing Show? I forgot, Jeremy. I did not. Uh, okay. I had a million things going on at work that 
that week. I was okay. planning on going Friday after work, and I wound up working until nine o'clock. So. I know we were gonna con- we were gonna connect there, but it's no big deal. But I ran into a product. What I was bringing that up for is I ran into a product that was called Cooler Fresh, and it's I believe Fishing Tackle Unlimited is carrying it now. Uh, if not, they've got a website, and I'll try to plug this in the show notes. But the product's called Cooler Fresh, and what it does is it's an enzyme that acts with like turning a bad smell into a good smell, and and kind of you know working to to keep your cooler fresh okay instead of having it you know be stinky and everything else because we've all had stinky coolers that we've left sit too long or whatever the case may be and uh this just comes in a spray bottle you spray it like you're painting and uh and there you go uh it's the enzymes that 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 kind of fight the bacteria and uh and keep your stuff smelling good so there's another plug for them. <laughs> plug them yeah. in the Houston Fishing Show, too. But I'm just thinking ideas like that about keeping your stuff dry, keeping your stuff cool, keeping your cooler smelling good. Uh, Arctic Ice, the one thing I like about that, Jeremy, and I, I can tell you listen to the podcast a lot because you know all the people I've mentioned. Um, but, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that I think uh, it's about keeping it dry and bacteria-free as, or as bacteria-free as possible. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, um, this year after I... I, I managed to get a deer on public with my bow this year, which I was absolutely astounded to do. Sure. But um, it was right when that big storm came in in November, and all the rain and everything. And yeah. I had, uh, you know, quartered it up, put it in the cooler. Uh, I since it was raining and uh, the woman of the house does not appreciate me taking large hunks of deer meat and cutting it up in the kitchen. Yeah, mine um, doesn't either. <laughs> uh, Mama was 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 not having it, no. so I decided I would take it over to Belleville Meat Market and just have it uh, all processed into into steaks and grind. Okay. Uh, between that and the fact that uh, it rather than than wasting more vacation time just sitting at home, I went ahead and went back to work. So I just left it in the cooler. Took it over there the next day, got it all handled, came back home, got busy with work and stuff. And the next thing I know, I go to reload up, you know, my quite expensive roto molded cooler in the back of my truck. And yes. it smell it, it did not smell very, very good. And it took me a fair amount of time to get that stink out of it. So yeah. yeah definitely anything that you can do to avoid having that last two inches of water floating down there in the bottom because i dumped it out and everything i just did not uh dump it out all the way i guess and it Let proceeded it to dry. to to ferment yeah. in the in the sun yeah, the for and everything about a else. week it's awful yeah and that's why i recommend that that product cooler fresh because and uh you know i'm trying to try to build a relationship with them but they really have a really good idea as far as keeping your stuff clean and fresh and what they do at the show was actually use a, a, a bottle of chum and you get to smell it on a rag that like you know a disposable paper towel and they spray this stuff on it and it works immediately it's crazy but uh just products like that that we didn't have years ago when we had to use all the bleach and all that other stuff all the harsh chemicals to get everything clean and smelling good again it's nice to have something like that oh yeah i i I may have purchased their product i don't remember what the name of the product i was but it was specifically for coolers to make them yeah not not stink anymore so it probably was their product and it it worked surprisingly well great idea Uh, as far as enzymes go yeah but as but as far as going to uh you know back to the ducks and sure ducks and geese and things of that nature um um, you know, everyone just breasts out their birds and it's, it's a great way if you have a lot of birds and you're in a hurry to get them clean. But, um, something I really recommend doing is, and it's something Trevor does a whole lot. It's something I'm kind of guilty of not doing that much, but is, you know, taking a whole duck and plucking it, um, a way that you can actually, uh, do it much faster and easier is if you take your duck and get you a, like the same kind of pot you'd you'd boil a head in for a euro mount or something sure. along those lines, a big pot that you can put on big an outside stock propane pot burner. Or something like that. Fill, yeah, right. Uh you know, fill it full of water and go over to the canning section in the supermarket. They have paraffin wax that they mm-hmm. use for sealing jars and take you three or four cubes of those and throw them into the boiling water till it all melts. And then take your duck and grab it by one of the legs and dip it down in there or by one of the wings and dip it down in there and pull it out and let it set. And then I have a refrigerator that I picked up off of Craigslist or Facebook marketplace for 50 bucks in my, in my garage that I use for nothing but aging, 
I age my birds. I like to age my ducks a minimum of three days for three to seven days. It allows kind of the blood to kind of settle out of them. Um, you always do them breast side up. Yep. So the, you know, the, the, if in the event that you did poke a hole in the guts with a BB, it's not running gut stuff sure. into your, into your breast meat. Sure. But you know, then you age them for, you know, three to seven days in, in a fridge. And then, if you dip them in that paraffin wax, you can pull that paraffin wax and it just peels all the feathers yeah, off. It'll that's look a like a good plucked, idea. A plucked chicken. There yeah, the it just peel off the wax and the feathers come off. Okay. Yep. There's an idea. And then you can, uh, it, it works a heck of a lot better than scalding them and, and sitting there. You're, and your neighbors will appreciate it a lot more so you don't have a bazillion feathers all yeah, over feathers your backyard. Yeah, feathers all over the place. Yeah. Like a cloud of feathers. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I didn't think about um, it. Nobody's ever brought that up to me as far as a way you can clean a, clean a duck like that or clean a bird like that. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. And then and there's what I like to do with a whole pluck duck. Is, uh, you familiar with spatchcocking? Yes. I've heard of it. I, I've not so, tried it before, but I know the I know the the, the method. Yes. Yeah. So is, is what you do is you take you a good heavy duty pair of uh, kitchen shears. I have a pair of Fisker ones, mm-hmm. and you just cut down the backbone and you cut the backbone out of it, and that gives you basically like when you order a uh, uh, a chicken half. Yeah, like butterflies at, at the barbecue place. Yeah, you know, right. so you can cut 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 out the backbone and then you can cut the breast. Sure. Or then you can take it and cut it into quarters, and then. Uh, Hank Shaw and the Duck Duck Moose or Duck Duck Goose book has a has a spectacular uh, like whole roasted pan roasted duck with the skin on with the crispy skin. Right. It's better. It's 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 a gourmet meal that you cook at home for a little bit of nothing, and it's it it never ceases to impress people whenever you serve them, you know, a gadwall or a mallard that you've done that way. It's it presents on the plate very beautifully, and it tastes spectacular. Whoa, that's really cool. Yeah, and you know that's just done in a cast iron skillet. You take it and you sear it and you pop it in it. I think it's four fifty for like ten or fifteen minutes. It, it's not very long at all, and it comes out golden brown with crispy skin and that fat renders in it. It's right. It's good. <laughs> uh, that's cool. I want to switch gears real quick to big game because a lot of us this time of year are killing hogs. We killed one back in late March and. Um, I wanted to talk as well about deer and that kind of stuff because we've eaten so much steak. I think we're out of deer steak, but I, uh, Fallow uh, died in my exotic business the other day, and um, it broke his neck in a in a in a fence thing, and, and we basically harvested it. It's about a ten month old uh, uh, fallow deer, uh, fall, male, you know, a buck. And uh, you talk about some good meat when you get them young. You know, they've, I've heard fallow deer say that, you know they're kind of older, livery tasting deer, but this thing tasted better than whitetail. And um, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, that goes back to I think to the way that you cook it and Correct. the way that you feel. Because you know, I've had I've had black buck, I've had fallow, I've had you know, I have lots of friends who have a lot more money than I do and go on some. <laughs> some really neat trips <laughs> and, you know, and then take some re- really neat animals. And, you know, they're always kind enough to bring me a, you know, a few packages of meat. And I've had many of them say, man, this stuff isn't any good and I'll take it and cook it. And to me, meat's meat. You know, everyone says, you know, all oh, the young ones eat better than the old ones about the only, the only thing that I can, and I can't even personally speak to this, but this is a few other guys I know that are excellent cooks where they're kind of like, the one thing that you don't really want to to, to jack with is a old, ruddy mule deer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they say they 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 taste kind of sagey, but right. even even then, I think if you if you work with it right and cook it right, I think it's still very very good. And you know, if you process your own meat. The worst case scenario you wind up with is, is okay, you have a bunch of meat that doesn't taste great. Right. Well, now it's just time time to break out the grinder and the sausage stuffer. And, you know, you know, that's something I know a lot of guys do here in Texas. And, and no fault on them because I did it for a long time, too. And this is what I thought you did. You took your deer, you took your back straps out, you took the rest of them. you like, jalapeno cheese and spicy sausage. That's, right. You know, that that's what deer meat was. Yep. And it's great. You know, if I, if I could shoot three deer a year, 
I guarantee you I would do that with one of them because I love deer sausage as much as the next guy. Sure. But, you know, when it comes to, to big game is, you know, everyone says, oh, well, you know, it only cost me, uh, you know, 38 cents to, to harvest this deer. Well, not by the time you factor your hunting license, your gas, your Good travel, time. your time. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you're on a lease, all that corn, the yeah. cost of the lease, everything else. You know, that's some of the most expensive protein there is on the face of the yeah, planet. Right. And, um, you know, personally, like I said, I love deer sausage, but I want to taste you know that meat, not the, not not the pork and the jalapeno and the cheese and everything they they add to the sausage. Right. Um, you want to taste the essence of the deer, basically. Yeah. Exactly. I'd rather I'd rather you know venison has a very you know unique taste to it that I like better than beef. I'd rather if I had a choice between a a, a prime ribeye or you know a front shoulder of deer, I'd probably take the front shoulder of deer every day. Um. But I know where you were kind of going with this yeah. is like different ways to do deer besides, you know, like you said, like I told you at the beginning, you know, everybody just chicken fries it or or grills it. There's a million different ways, um, especially with kind of some of the the newer ways of cooking that are kind of filtering down into the, the to the hunting and outdoors yes. scapes. Um, like you sous know, and that kind of these, stuff, all the different yeah, sous vide, yeah, right. uh, the pellet smokers, right? Pellet uh, grills, a, yeah. A, pe- a pellet smoker, you know, like a like a Traeger yep. or a Yoder or a Green Mountain or mm-hmm. a Camp Chef yep. or the Outdoor Gourmet from Academy. Right. All those electric pellet smoker things, those are great because they have such great temperature controls, and most of them have the built-in probes to where you know you can get your meat to that perfect, you know, rare state pull it off and let it rest and come up to medium rare or you can do the reverse sear on them where you take them you smoke them and then you you either uh i know on the the traegers and the camp chefs they have uh where you can turn them to like 550 degrees so you pull your meat off you crank it up and then you sear it off to caramelize the the outside of the meat sure. but keep that rare center or you can just use a cast iron skillet on your on your stove top get it super hot and just sear it off well, this goes back to what you were talking about before is is how to eat wild game. And I mean, I I know a lot of people that are hunters and fishermen and whatnot to listen to this will will agree that medium rare is but you know, it took my wife a while to get on that train. The way that my dad learned how to eat medium rare is my uh grandfather this is before my time back in the seventies. Um my grandfather came over, uh, my, my maternal grandfather came over, his, his father-in-law, and he, it was 6 o'clock, he was ready to eat, and the meat wasn't done yet. And so they ate it, and it was medium rare, and he said it was a, didn't need any steak sauce. I mean, it was just the best tasting steak he'd ever had because he didn't overcook it. And he taught me how to eat it. But the thing is, it's the essence of the animal at that point of medium rare. You're tasting a little bit of the blood. You're tasting some of the little rawness in the meat. I mean, you're tasting. I, for me, there's no better way to connect with what you've killed. You know, to to be a little graphic. I mean, it's it's just it's just so. So I've got my wife. She, her and I have it down to a science of whether we grill it outside or whether we do it inside to get it perfectly cooked every time. And I mean, if, if it's a thin, skinny steak or a thick cut steak, whatever the case may be, or back strap or a or a, uh, uh, a round steak. I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah the the best way, like if you want a consistent cook every single time, like I said, you're either going to go with a pellet smoker with a with a probe. Right. Or, or as you cook it on the grill, you know, take, take you a, a thermometer with a probe on it, you know, and pull it off when it gets to, you know, 115, 120, yes. 125, if you like it more to the, to the well done side. But like I said, with, and then the other thing is with wild game is definitely let it rest. rest. Yeah. But I, the that's best thing, thing I found, about. especially for cooking steaks of different thicknesses and stuff is I've just recently started getting into this is a sous vide. You okay. take them, you put a, you vacuum seal it, um, and you plop it in your your water bath with your with your sous vide set to you know one twenty, and you go to work, and it cooks all day long. Wow! And then when you come home, and then it won't ever go past that hundred and twenty, and so it just stays at a constant hundred and twenty degrees, and it it will turn a cheap steak into a steak that eats like butter and that's a beef steak and it'll do the same thing with with your tougher cuts of venison um a buddy of mine got a 
a whole 50, 60 pounds of uh, buffalo meat. And okay. the first time we, we, we cooked it, it was uh, to say that it was hard to chew would be an understatement. And this <laughs> was from an old bull buffalo. I mean, and it was it was tough and it was not the best cuts of meat. And the guy just had too much, not enough in his freezer, gave it to him. He gave me some of it. And finally, the way that we found to make it tender was to sous vide it to okay. keep it medium rare because I mean, you could have done it in a crock pot and you know, with, with like a Brown gravy or something like that and made like beef tips and rice with it. But I wanted to eat a Buffalo steak. And the first time I did it, I did everything just right, but it was extremely chewy. I mean, it was hard to cut with a knife. <laughs> That's pretty chewy. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it, it was tough. It was, it was very yeah. tough. And I was like, I've had, you know, the bison they sell at Whole Foods before. I've had the bison from the store. And I'm like, it's not supposed to be like this. I get it that this was a quasi wild, you know, bison. And I get that it was a very old, you know, and it wasn't raised, you know, to be meat. And it was basically, it was a cull bull right. from a, from a high fence whatever. place yeah, right. that, uh, that, you know, the guy got a, a steal of price on because it started killing younger bulls and was no longer viable. Mm -hmm. So they um, was basically like, hey, the first person with X amount of dollars who can come out here and shoot this thing, come shoot it like today. And so he got a steal of a deal on it. And he wound up with close to 800 pounds of meat, I think he said. Oh, Lord, it's a lot of meat. I know buffaloes pack it on for sure. So, I mean, I've, I've been around, obviously, in the hunting ranch work that I do and stuff. I've been around that stuff. And. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty thick. And I'm just going to say, you know, we just did a wild boar and, and a lot of people say that, you know, wild, wild hogs that are boars, you know, don't taste good because they have too much testosterone or hormones in them that make them taste rank and everything like that. This boar we killed hardly had that smell at all. And he's probably 225 pounds, probably two and a half inch tusks. And I told the story on the show before, but basically he, um, uh, quartered it up, used a little bit, a little bit of vinegar and lemon juice, which is an old trick I learned when I first started hog hunting, and um, let it sit for about two or three days. Cut it up, cut up the the shoulders for for grind, and then and then the the, the my wife calls them mastodon legs. The uh, the rear quarters I smoked both of them for my birthday, and let me tell you that that was really good pork. I mean that was really really high quality uh, meat. We chopped up the remainder that we after we pulled them off the grill and and shredded out the pork. We basically uh, poured in barbecue sauce, poured in the past uh, uh, sausage that we had left over through that in the in the food processor, chopped it up finely, mixed it with barbecue sauce, and you got pulled pork barbecue sandwiches for the rest of creation. You know. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do with things that a lot of people, like you were saying about the ruddy mule deer. I mean, just about everything I've caught or cooked or killed, it's, it's been something that I've made something presentable out of it. It may not be the best that there ever was, but if you prepare it right, it all comes in that. And obviously how you care for it in the field is important too. Yeah. I'm with you on the wild hogs. I've never had a, a, a bad, be it sow, boar, you know, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. I've never had a bad one. The thing is, I think so many people with a hog, they're, especially here in Texas, they're so dismissive of it. They'll shoot it, and, you know, maybe there's a whole bunch of them. They go chase another one, you know, for a while or shoot, you know, 10 of them, and they go pick out, you know, all right, well, this one here's a good eater size. You know, I've always heard, right. you know, don't eat anything over 100 pounds. That's yeah, like, that's not true. I've never had a wild hog that if you shoot it, you kill it, you go out there, you gut it, you skin it, and you get it on ice, that it's not better than pork you buy in the store. No. It doesn't matter whether it's a boar, a sow, bar pig, whatever. It doesn't matter. It it has more flavor, the meat's richer, and it just tastes better. Yeah. I mean, there's guys out there selling pasture-raised pork, which is basically a wild hog that they supplement you know, with, with some feed, but it basically goes out there and makes a living in a, in a field you know, and they're selling that stuff for thirty dollars a pound here right. in Texas. You know, if, if you've got a a deer lease that has them, you know, you can go out there and get you one most weekends if you put in a little time and effort. Or, you know, a lot of farmers and ranchers, you know, maybe you pay them a little bit of trespass fee, or maybe you know, you just tell them, "Hey, I'm a good, responsible hunter." You know, and, and I see the hogs are tearing up your, you know, your field out there. You know, you mind if I come sit out here? 
a couple evenings during the week and, you know, shoot a couple of them, get them off your field. Right. You know, you can maybe get you some permission. There's plenty of public land around Texas too. That's loaded up with hogs and, you know, for your $48 annual hunting permit, you can go out there and, you know, get you some good protein for a little bit of nothing. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And, and that's the thing. There's nothing, uh, it just, you know, there's so many misconceptions about this. And obviously with wild pork, you want to cook it to avoid trichinosis, brasiliosis, and stuff like that all the way. But there's so much misconception that, oh, I don't like that because I tried it once and it was no good. And I'm like, you probably tried it when somebody didn't really know how they were doing it right. And it takes a lot of trial and error to get where you and I are when it comes to that stuff. I just encourage people, do what works, but you know, listen to us and write, read your cookbooks and stuff like that. But don't, don't give up on something just because somebody has told you that it's bad. I mean, try it for yourself and see if that's something that works for you, you know. Uh, I, I the first pig I ever killed, 2005, was uh, was a uh, a big old like 300 pound pig, and uh, and it smelled awful. But and that was around the time Hur- Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Reader came through, and they uh, you know I had the whole family over to cook pig. It didn't even taste it. Everybody thought it was commercial pork. Didn't even taste exactly. like it was that it was because I prepared it right. You know Ex- exactly. If if you take care of your meat, it it tastes fine. Um, another. Uh, you know, game animal here in Texas that, that people typically don't eat is, you know, the collared peccary, the javelina. Yeah, javelina. Um, yeah. Uh, Evan this year went down to his place he hunts down in South Texas. He, he shot a pig, a javelina, and they bought a, a, uh, a, a pork loin. And they took, you know, the back strap of each one of them. Right. Uh, and he took them all with him on ice up to Nebraska up on a trip he was on. And they seasoned them all up and threw them on the on the smoker and cooked them all the exact same way. And they cooked it up to, you know, 155, you know, where you kill trichinosis. And then they proceeded to uh, indulge in some adult libations and have a good time. And they pulled them off and they did the, the, the taster's the taster's choice challenge. And, you know, they could tell the domestic pork loin because it was bigger, but the javelina and the pork they both said tasted better than the domestic pork and they couldn't they had forgotten which one was which which was the pig and which was the javelina yeah i mean it it, it's just all in the way that and a lot of people don't like javelina because they stink you know when you have to gut them i mean especially if you gut shoot one of them or god forbid you gut shoot any animal but I mean, it's just, it's not, but I mean, I think in a way, as far as the spiritual connection that we have to hunting, we owe it to that animal. I don't typically kill unless I eat. And I just, I I think that there's that kind of connection to nature in our souls and what we do. And you believe that I know with, with what you do with, uh, with, uh, the, some of the organizations you're with and stuff that, that it just, it's just, it's more than just, it's about conservation. It's about, you know, preserving our, 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 for the generation, but it's also about connecting with the source of that meat. And I think that's a, more of a spiritual look at. But listen, dude, I eat, you know, um, wild game for the same reason that vegetarians don't eat meat because I don't really agree with what goes on with the slaughterhouses and stuff like that. And that may sound, you know, kind of frou frou tree hugging stuff. But at the same time, I want to know where my meat's coming. And the essence of me connecting with that animal that I harvested is to eat it, you know. And I mean, that's the thing a lot of anti hunters don't understand, but I wish they would. So. <laughs> Well, I feel like a lot of that's coming around. I feel it like is. there's a lot of new people getting into hunting that are in it just for the food. Just for the meat, yeah. I know. I've and, seen that, and, too. And, and I'm trend. all for that. I'm, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I eat wild game as often as I eat, you know, store-bought meat. And I'd eat more if I was a more successful hunter. But with kids and a family and a job and everything else, I don't get to hunt as many days as, as I would like. Right. But you know, I definitely try to utilize as much as a, of every animal I shoot as I can. Sure. And and the other thing is, is like, okay, you know, you said that, you know, the, oh, there's a lot of things that people say, oh, you can't eat that. And you're right. There's For a long time, there were a whole lot of things that, like, I just wouldn't shoot. I wouldn't shoot uh, mergansers for a long time because I heard they were no good. Um, and then I wouldn't shoot coots, really, because I heard they were no good. Well, I was having a real slow day duck hunting one time, and I had probably 
20 dozen kooks keep swimming through my decoys, swimming through my decoys, swimming through my decoys. And finally, I just had enough of it. I was like, you know what? I'm taking something home today. And I wound up, oh, probably shooting seven, eight coots. And, you know, I I know a lot of boys from Louisiana. They they really love eating that coot. You know, they like getting that big old gizzard out of them and, and frying them up. I'm not much on gizzards. So, but they got a fair amount of breast meat on them. And they smelt pretty fishy and they did not smell like the cleanest duck in the world. And I was like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with these things. So I took all those breasts and I threw them in the crock pot and I took a big bottle of barbecue sauce and poured it all over them and just sat in the crock pot on low all day. And I came back and I shredded that meat up and it, in all honesty, like, it was a it was a pulled meat sandwich. You couldn't tell if it was pork or if it was beef or if it was chicken or what it was, but it was a pulled meat sandwich and it was good. And ever since that time I was like, you know, if I ever have a day where a whole bunch of coots are swimming around in my decoys, uh they're probably gonna have a bad day because yeah. <laughs> it, it would it will it will definitely eat. Yeah. No, there's one, Scott Lasayeth, or I forget what the guy's name is, I think it's Scott, the guy that does uh, one of the cooking shows on the, uh, one of the outdoor TV shows, but he, he, he was talking, he was in Louisiana, and, and he was saying, well, what about a coot, and he actually really made something good out of a coot, you know, out of some coots that he shot, and uh, it was kind of the catch, clean, cook style, you know, TV show of, of going out there and killing it and grilling it, and, um, you know, I'm, those shows are really starting to gain popularity. The whole culture towards uh, clean eating, you know, uh, it's one of the things Chester Moore and I were just talking about the other day. Clean eating and, and eating organic and eating natural and that soul connection with nature, which is more of a thing for me at least, you know, uh, is, is, is a lot more prevalent now than it used to be and i think part of that's because of organizations like bha that you know that really are are big about conservation and about the essence of why we hunt and not so much just about going out and killing the biggest and baddest and best thing and i mean that's the thing i hunt for meat dude i'll just be straight up with you man and i fish for meat too um you know but it i just i love it all and i mean I, i we eat a lot of wild meat here my wife i've turned on to everything i bring in the house except for gar uh, that's about it, but she'll eat everything that I bring in here. And, uh, Cause I've trained, uh, not really trained her, but she's learned over the years how I make it. And we've, we've kind of tweaked and modified our recipes. Like we do venison enchiladas and we use Velveeta cheese. That's one of our own little things. Cause it's creamier and it melts better and stuff like that. Uh, we use bacon burger, uh, bacon deer burger and, uh, and make venison enchiladas out of that at homemade. And, uh, we're going to have those for father's day that we just decided that the other day. That that that's hard to beat. I mean, something like that. Yeah. It's, oh my gosh. Okay. Well, here you go. Here's another another. This is probably probably my son's favorite thing I make with venison. Okay. It's and it's it's the easiest thing in the world. Uh, you know, my mom used to make it with beef when I was a kid growing up, and it's it's a great little thirty minute meal that's super easy. And you know, I grind all my own deer meat, with the exception of this year. Um, but I'll just take a pound of ground venison. Um, I like a little finer grind for this, but you can use a chili grind for it too. And you, you brown it up in a skillet. It's, uh, it's, it's beef stroganoff, but with venison. Ah, I love and it. then, and I'll, but it's the easiest thing in the world to make. Cause it's literally a 30 minute meal tops. And so you take it, you brown it up in a skillet. What's nice about venison is you don't have to drain off all the fat. Cause there's no fat in yep. the venison. Um, you take it, you brown it. I like to, to season it up with a little salt, pepper, garlic, onion powder and cook it up with that on it. And then I'll take a can of cream of mushroom soup, dump it in there, about half a can of milk, pour it in there, let it simmer for about 10, 15 minutes all together while the, while the egg noodles are cooking. Do the egg noodles, pop it in, spoon that on it. And like my son probably asked me twice a week to make that. And it's <laughs> quick, it's simple, it's delicious. It's not probably the greatest thing in the world for you with that cream of mushroom soup in it but oh, there's at least one day a week where when i get home where i'm just like i'm i'm tired i don't really feel like cooking and i mean it, it probably takes me 15 minutes to make it it takes me longer to go to the freezer pull the meat out and thaw it out enough to get it out of the out of the 
the package right. to start cooking it. Right, right, right. No, that's and so there are a lot of simple things. I mean, a lot of things. It goes without saying that you know you can substitute a lot of things that are be that call for beef for venison. You just have to watch your your um, your ratio when it comes to fat that you don't overcook it. Number one, but number two, that you that you have enough. You know that you that it's going to be a lean meat, and you're expecting that. You know instead of beef being a little more fattier, but um, there's just so many different ways you can do. There's so many great cookbooks on the market right now. I'll probably put a couple of the ones that I have, and then the one that you suggested in my in the show notes uh, as well, so people can check out. But I mean, there's just a lot of different. Um, oh, I'll put Amazon links even better. Um, I'll, but I, I basically, you know, I just I just wanted to have I, this show's been on my heart lately because I've been like. You know, what's the essence of why we hunt and fish all the time? What is all this leading up to? And I think this is one of the things that uh, that kind of ties it all together, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the last kind of thing that I know most people don't think about when it comes to, um, you know, big game meat sure. is take your shanks. Mm-hmm. Um, Steven Ranella from Meat Eater, he's real big on, on, on shanks. And he has an Asabuco recipe that you can get online. Asabuco, yeah. And and I can't tell you how many you know deer piles I've seen where all the shanks are left in there. Take those shanks, get you a get you a little saw and saw them up and make you Asabuco, and you will look like a five star gourmet chef, and (laughs) everyone will love them. It's so good. Yeah, I've got to try Um, that one time. That's awesome. And. And then definitely, you know, as far as cookbooks go, you know, the ones that I go to for my wild game is uh, Stephen Ranella's new meat eater cookbook that he came out with uh, around Christmas. There's that one. There is the uh, the three Hank Shaw books, the Duck Duck Goose, the Buck Buck Moose, and the Cotton Quail Cotton. It's <laughs> it's it, it's squirrel. Quail cottontail, I think, is what it's called. <laughs> I love those days. And, and that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> and that's his, uh, that's his, you know, that's his small game book. And if you can't figure out, like, buck, buck, moose is all your, all your, uh, your big all game. your hooved animals, yeah. you know, your cervids, your deer, your elk, your moose, things like that. Duck, duck, goose is your, is your, is your birds. Right. And then your pheasant quail cottontail is, is, is your, uh, that's what it is, pheasant quail cottontail. Okay. And that's all your, all, all your other small game, um, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of just delicious things, you know, especially in the small game world. There's a million different ways that you can cook all that stuff, you know, uh, squirrel and dumplings. Uh, you know, you can do hot wings with squirrels or rabbits or anything yep. like that. I mean, there's a million different ways to cook things besides uh, just, you know, breading it in flour and throwing it in hot oil, which is a delicious way to eat things. But if you want to take it to the next level, that's a definitely – you know, four books I would suggest to to step your cooking game up, and then when you're really ready to to step your game up to the next level, is um, you know, try processing one of your own animals and try dry aging. You know, go find you a, a cheap fridge and, and hang you a quarter, you know, a front quarter, you know, in in there for you know ten days, fourteen days, and trim the rind off and just see what a difference it makes to your meat. Hmm. I mean, you go, you go, got buy you a forty three age, a forty three day age, age ribeye at a steakhouse. You know, that's a that's a hundred dollar steak. You know, you can do that in a in a fridge in your garage. You know, with your venison, and it will take it to the next level. Yeah, it's also about a healthier way to eat than just you know simply throwing it in the oil or, or or you know wrapping it in bacon. And there's nothing wrong with that, like you said. But I mean, it's also a cleaner way to eat your eat your meat that it comes to. You know, something that's lean and something that's going to be a good source of protein, but it's not going to be all fatty and everything else like a lot of the commercial meat. And just like I said before, no GMOs, no hormones, that kind of stuff. I mean, grass-fed, corn-fed, um, you know, just really, really good good meal, um, you know, you can make. And there's just so many things you can make for sides. I mean, the list just goes on forever. But I've been wanting to have a show like this on for a while, and it just kind of occurred to me you'd be one of the best people to ask because you guys on your podcast have talked over the years about – you know, cooking what you catch and cooking what you what you kill, and just just having and just enjoying the outdoor lifestyle, which I've become more and more big about this on the show, because of the fact that it it's kind of tying it all in together, as in why we do what we do. It's an essence of uh, of understanding the the connection we have to nature. I guess to be a little deep here for a minute. Yeah, definitely. At, at the end of the day, it's great to bring home 
you know, some meat you harvest from the field, be it a, be it a duck, a dove, whatever. But the real joy of it is, is, you know, taking that, that protein that you go out, you work hard for, you harvest, you come home, you lovingly prepare it. I mean, you take your time with it, you know, you make sure that it's, it's, it's dead on perfect. And, and then, you know, you have friends or family over, you know, and you're all sitting around the backyard, around the grill, enjoying a cold beverage and you get to relive your hunt and tell your story about, you know, where this meat came from, how it came to go from, you know, a deer walking around in a field to, you know, you, you know, you know, placing that perfect shot on it or, you know, you know, setting up your decoys and how the ducks came and worked in and how the sunrise was that morning and how, you know, that buck was out there, you know, tending a doe and you get to tell your story and you get to kind of relive your hunt again and, you know, take people that may not hunt or fish or, you know, be a part of the outdoors and bring them into it with the food. It's really kind of brings it full circle. And at the end of the day, you know, if you got to put a lot of seasons and spice on it to make it the way you like it, Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But I feel that there's something very kind of like, like special about just fire, salt, pepper, and yeah. just cooking it that yeah. way. And, you know, try something that way that, that you've never done before. And, and you'd be surprised if you don't overcook it and you take your time with it, just how good just salt and pepper and some fire is. No, that's good. And I mean, like I said, it, it, I think the biggest enjoyment I get out of that lifestyle and hunting and fishing is sharing it with all the non-hunters in my life. That's what I wanted to do for my 40th birthday a couple of weeks ago. I just wanted to have, there are a couple of things I did, but there, I just wanted to have everybody over to try the pig that Jackson, you know, got with the dogs and, you know, and just, just experience how much fun that is to feed everybody from something you harvested, you know, and I think that's something that, that kind of drives home. And I'd love to have you back on Jeremy for a fishing show for, um, for talking about catch and catch and clean and cook, um, you know, uh, wild fish because, uh, you know, I've got a good redfish on a half shell recipe. I know we didn't get into all that this time, but I mean, there's just so much other stuff that we can talk about as far as preparing fish for sure from just deep frying there's it a, or, or grilling. There's it. A, I say, I say, I say, there's, there's a million different ways to eat fish besides, <laughs> you know, rolling in, in some Louisiana fish fry. And right. Some fish fry. In the pan. But, yeah, that's but, but that too, may be yeah. my favorite. Yeah, I know. I love you might too, but I've got a awesome, awesome redfish on the half shell recipe. I want to share it with you too. So maybe we'll connect. I've got, on another a, I show. got a, I got a pretty good one too. If I, I know have, you do. Uh, I know. I, and I wanted to try yours, but yeah, yeah I, I tried my father-in-law's instead, but yeah, I'm going to try yours next. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was about to say if uh, if if on some of these coastal trips I've got come planned, uh, we'll have to we'll have to get together up there in the hill country and I'll bring some bring some redfish on yeah. the half shell and we can have a we can have a, a, a grill off a grill off we can see which ones they like the best right <laughs> invite a bunch of people over I love it <laughs> a grill off and then we could be like going head to head like they do in the barbecue competitions and sweating and wiping the sweat off our brow <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm not going to be that passionate about it. I'm not going to lie. I'm gonna, I know. I'm, I'm going to sit around and, and eat, eat a bunch of good food and tell a bunch of big stories. Drink a couple of cold ones. Yeah, that's right. So anyway, but anything uh, of people to contact you, Jeremy, to uh, find you on social media before we close out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can keep up with everything that I have going on uh, on our Facebook and Instagram. It's Cast Blast Grill Chill, and then uh, the podcast will be rolling out again here real soon we've been kind of taking a hiatus since uh hunting season trying to get some things lined up uh we've added uh a new person to the team uh evan porterfield he's a member of bha along with me and trevor and we're working on getting a bunch of really good guests lined up we're trying to get a whole bunch of them stacked in the tank and getting ready to to roll out with a a whole new season of content you know living the outside the outdoors, you know, lifestyle that we like to live and giving you tips and tricks to get it done. You guys have really inspired me in a lot of ways to really, you know, sit back a little bit more and chill out and just enjoy what is the outdoor lifestyle. And just the thing I appreciate about y'all and your show, it's so conversational. It's so storytelling. It's experiencing the good, bad, and the other like public land and just, you know, conservation. And I just, y'all have inspired me a lot with your show. And I want to thank you again, Jeremy, for listening to mine. So it means a lot. I, I greatly appreciate it. And anybody, um, Memorial Day weekend, if you're in the San Antonio area, uh, backcountry hunters and anglers is going to be 
hosting the Full Draw Film Tour down there at Leading Edge Archery. Uh, you guys should go out there and check it out. And for the folks in the Houston area, the uh, Full Draw Film Tour will be hosted by backcountry hunters and anglers there, too. There, too, at um, Texas Archery. Uh, so if you'd like June to go out there and check one, it out, right. there'll be uh, good times, good folks, and some really awesome uh, hunting films. You said June 22nd for that other one, right? Yes, sir. June 22nd. It- 6 30 p.m all right cool i just want to make sure we mention the date for the houston one since we have a lot of listeners in houston so i'll try to post uh links to those in the show notes too so y'all can check that out and then we have an air gun show coming up so yeah there's all kinds of fun stuff i'll post in the show notes as far as activities and stuff that are coming up so um but yeah thanks a lot for being on jeremy i really appreciate you anytime dustin i appreciate it And there he goes, Mr. Jeremy Beeston. All those cookbooks that we talked about in this podcast, I have got the Meat Eater Fishing Game Cookbook, uh, the Buck Buck Moose Cookbook, the Duck Duck Goose, and the Pheasant Quail Cottontail Cookbook. All three of those. I've got the links on to where you can buy those from Amazon, get them shipped straight to your house on two-day prime uh, shipping. Uh, I've got the links of both, all three of those on the... uh, on the website, there are affiliate links. I'll just be honest with you. There are affiliate links to uh, to our our um, account, and that'll help support the show if you buy the books that way. But uh, even if you don't, that's cool. I just wanted to make those available to you as resources. I, I've got a bad habit of having books that I don't necessarily read all the time, but I busted out this one that I looked at. My wife bought me Project Smoke a while back. She's a foodie and a food blogger. I'll put her blog in the show notes too, Serafina's Kitchen. Uh, she's got a lot of the wild game stuff that I've done over the years on her blog. But um, the America's Best Barbecue Recipes and Techniques from Prize Winning Ribs, Wings, Brisket, and more. It's a hardcover uh, by Arthur Aguirre. That's one of the books that kind of inspires me to do what I do in the backyard as far as cooking and um, uh, smoking and um, uh, you know uh, grilling meat. And it's just a lot of fun. Uh, the other one that I wanted to mention too is Project Smoke Smoke by Stephen Reikland. I believe it's Reikland. Stephen Reikland, Project Smoke. I listen to his show all the time on PBS or the KLRU, whatever the local uh, public television network that we have here. He's been on TV for a number of years, and he just is a really cool uh, TV show that it really talks about um, you know smoking things and grilling things and doing things in the outdoors, uh, in the outdoor kitchen lifestyle kind of thing. And I mean that's just really really fun and cool. So anyway, it is late at night when I'm recording this, the week before this podcast release, so I'm a little loopy. I apologize for that. Love you guys so much for tuning in. Again, thank you guys so much for checking out our podcast. Please tell a friend if you like what you hear. Please leave us a five-star rating. Um, Also, uh, if you've not done so already, subscribe, 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 Texas Fishing Game has a newsletter at fishgame.com you can sign up for. You can get news every three times a week, every day just about, because we have email blast, we have uh, sponsored digital programs that we're doing, and we've got the regular Tuesday, Tactical Tuesday, Tactical and Practical Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, State of the, uh, Wednesday, oh, Jesus, getting late, Wednesday is the Wildlife Wednesday, Thursday is the Texas State of the Outdoor Nation, and those are all free to you, get delivered in your inbox, kind of like getting a mini magazine, you've got stories, you can read blog posts on different subjects of self-defense, you've got things on uh, conservation, you've got things on hunting, you've got things on fishing, all kinds of different things. You can also order our shirts and stuff like that at fishcam.com. We're in a fishing shirt right now. Um, I just love this stuff. And also we have going on right now in the middle of this uh, podcast uh, broadcast, we are uh, launching the program that we have through PowerPole, which is called Fishing Strategies You Can Trust. Now to find that program, all you have to do is go to our website, fishgame.com, And at the time that this airs, you'll be able to see our slider up at the top that has our current issue, which is May right now, that's rotating in the actual um, uh, kind of a rotation of slides. And one of the slides is Fishing Strategies You Can Trust, sponsored by PowerPole. And PowerPole's logo for this is, our slogan for this is, We Build Trust. They're really big about customer care. And I've got articles that I've written as part of that and that Chester's written as part of that as far as fishing techniques, new ideas, Great opportunities for you to get out there and and uh, use your power pole if you have one on your boat or look if you're considering buying a power pole or a talon, it'll give you some options of why power pole is a is a really good um, 
really good option for you. So nothing against talent. It's just it's just what a lot of people have said about uh, one over the other. It's just really good. They sponsored this program for us, and I want to definitely give them a shout out and thank them for being a supporter of Texas Fishing Game Magazine, especially in the digital uh, format. We're really growing a lot in digital, guys, and you'll see a lot more sponsors and stuff come on this podcast and stuff. And I just really uh, look forward to the future looks like with this show, and I really look forward to just having you guys on for the ride, man. This is just four Four years ago this month, guys, four years ago, I uh, started this show just as a way to get out there, and I had like three downloads the first episode, <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and it's just, it's kind of a celebration this month, it really is, because it's something that I, you know, I love to be able to talk to you guys about things that are relevant to your life, you know, I don't talk about giant yachts and and sport fishing, you know, for, for giant, um, you know, uh, marlin and stuff like that. Stuff that, we, you know, you may never do. This is all about things that are relevant to you. These are all things that are engaging to you. And they're all things that are that are meaningful and significant to you, I hope. You know, that's always my goal with this show. is things that anybody can get out and do. And, and do well at and have fun at and just enjoy the outdoors. Get to know God better. Get to know Jesus better. Get to know um, themselves better you know get to know their family better all the things that the outdoor therapy <laughs> allows us to do there's just so many 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 blessings that I just want to bestow upon you with this show and uh, and and I believe we're here for two reasons guys y'all heard me say this in my other content I believe that we are here to love and care about each other and to acquire knowledge and in that acquiring knowledge we learn to love and care about each other and one of the things that we're here to acquire knowledge on is to love and care about each other so i love and care about each one of you guys podcasting is such an intimate format because you know i'm literally in your head you know you're literally listening to this in your earphones or your your uh, ipad ipad or your iphone or your um android or your you know samsung or your lg or whatever phone uh, or on a computer or whatever, but I'm literally in your head right now, you know, and that's kind of a cool thing. I, I was reading a podcasting book about this the other day, and it really just kind of drove home that how special this relationship is that I have with you guys, the listener. You know, the fact that y'all invite me into your uh, earbuds or um, or your, your 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 phone speaker or whatever, however you listen um every you know every two weeks and the fact that a lot of you guys that are jeremy being one of those guys that are kind of hardcore listeners really um really appreciate that so anyway i'm off on a tangent again <laughs> i appreciate you guys thank you so much for uh, for checking out our show again please tell a friend and as always thank you for watching reading and listening to our stuff have an awesome day in the outdoors we'll see you next time <laughs>